Hi, I'm Bill Corcoran Jr. and I'm your host for the On The Stacks podcast. Today, I'm chatting with retired NFL football player, Ron Solt. What's up, podcast episode 66 of the On The Stacks podcast in the Blue Door studio. Welcome to the podcast, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, you made me put on this this silly green Eagles helmet and all my friends are going <laughs> to... They're going to give me shit for it, but uh, it's okay. Um, and, and by the way, um, episode 66, you were also uh, number 60. I'm going to tell you some story about that. And but listen to me. That helmet you were wearing has some Dallas silver on it if you want to check it out. Oh, so, yeah. does it? Yeah, exactly. Hit a few Dallas players. You had to day. get one or two of them. I know. Yeah, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. I and know you a, are. Yeah, so... <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna get shit for it but that's all right that's all right so but yeah like i said so it, it this this it wasn't planned this way but uh it just kind of meant to be that uh you 66 came... okay i'll tell you a story about 66 the day that i played football for the first time jp mech who was my coach at coughlin gets me over to the locker room and he's gonna give out jerseys right now i had number 82 was available 66 and i think like some other number and i think i might have been 82 for a day or two and then I began 66. How come? Because I think 82 wasn't really a guard position. So, okay. I, I, although I always wanted to be a tight end, I think I was misdiagnosed being an offensive lineman. I think I could have been a real good tight end, but my hands were too small. I had little girl hands. You never noticed that, did you? Uh, I, I kind of noticed <laughs> when I shook your hands. You no, had I'm little kidding. hands. I know I do. <laughs> so, so you know, tell me a little bit about your background. You're from you're from Miners Mills. You grew up here in, in you know in northeastern Pennsylvania. Tell me a little bit about you know your family and your background. Right. When I was growing up, my first year playing ball was at Plains Junior High School. As back before they switched over to Coughlin and. Uh, we uh, see way back then in ninth grade, the first game of the year. I forget who we were playing, but I went dove hunting. You know what dove hunting is? I went hunting instead of playing football. Could you imagine? JP should have wringed my neck. <laughs> so, so he's the one that really got you got you into football. Yeah, you know what, Coach Mech used to pick me up from school, bring me to practice to lift take me from practice to my home in Miners Mills and drop me off because he knew darn well if I start running with some of the hippies down at the tracks, there was no coming back. I'd have been ruined. So yeah. JP always took special care of me. That's good. And uh, is he still around? He's living down in Tampa, Florida right now. As a matter of fact, I'll send him a copy of this when we see him. Oh, definitely. That's, that's, yeah. that's really cool. So he had a big influence on... Oh, uh, yeah. JP was probably one of the predominantly dominating coaches all through the 70s and the 80s. If I say something goofy, he'll let me know. 70s, 80s, I think in the 90s he coached. So yeah. he has some good teams, real good teams. And uh, and then after, after Coughlin High School, you went on to play at Maryland. Yes. I went to University of Maryland back in 1979 or 80. And then, uh, and then 1980... I uh, played three years. We won the ACC, I think, in one year. But unfortunately, I don't have my ACC ring anymore. It was lost. Oh, no. Could you imagine? That's ridiculous. You don't do that stuff. I should have had the ring. Yeah. And a watch. I I had a bull watch somewhere, but the bull watch, I think, was from Florida Tampa Bowl. Or not, Orlando, uh, the Disney. Remember when Disney had a bowl game there? Yeah. We played that one year, and in 83 it was. Really cool. So, so like, what were some of your experiences playing playing college football? Well, Maryland, we always had strong teams. We always really were winning every week. We won. I'm not sure if they're predominantly as strong now as we were then, but believe me, even Penn State. Penn State beat us. I never beat Penn State, but they, let me tell you something. They still do, by the way. Yes, they uh, No, Maryland won a couple years ago, didn't they? A couple years ago, Maryland pool went out. I don't know. Maybe maybe it, maybe they did, and maybe I'm just very hurt from it, and I just can't remember. <laughs> I don't could know. Be. But so. yeah, don't you worry. Penn State won more than I lost. Yeah. So what what would you say? You know, during your college years at Maryland playing football, what 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 would you say is one or two things that maybe you learned the most? You know what, Maryland. I was basically trying to learn how to survive. You know, you're leaving. Wilkes Bear and going to College Park, Maryland, and the kid's 18 years old. All of a sudden, he knows he's got to come in at a certain time. If I don't go to bed, I don't get rest. 
I can't perform the next day. And I'll tell you what, that's a good thing I learned at an early age. If you don't take care of yourself physically, you're not going to be able to play. And so fortunately, that same model is now ingrained in me. I feel like I got to go to the gym every morning, at least get a half hour in. It doesn't take a lot. 45 minutes, you do a quick root workout, you feel better. You still work, still working out? It's more I was there. You have to. Yeah. What you, do you really what, have to. What are you benching nowadays? Well, listen, we're not going to talk about that because I cannot <laughs> bench 500 anymore. <laughs> but I'm sure, listen to me, I'm sure if I, if I had somebody out there that really trained me properly, I could be good. Yeah. Again. Hell yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Because so, you have to have somebody with a little bit of attitude to before you, before you make a perform. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you, uh, you went in the first round of the, of the NFL draft. You were the, the 19th pick overall to the Colts in 1984. What was, uh, what was that experience like as a, as a young kid? You know what? More, sometimes more is thrown at you on the plate. If you could, if I knew now what I knew, if, if I knew then what I knew now, I would handle things a lot differently, of course, but we had a great time. And some of the players that I played with, the year I came out in the draft, Boomer Esiason was drafted in the, in the second round, and Pete Koch, who was a defensive end, played a bunch of years in the league, he was drafted before me in the first round. So we had some good talent come out. And the year before that, Mark Duda was drafted. He was up at Lackawanna now. And uh, we had some great people going through the program. Yeah. So, be, you know, just a, a moment ago, you said that you may have done some things differently. What would you have done differently? Well, you know what? Okay, if, if I'm going to tell my son to do certain things, some of the things that I was convinced needed to be done didn't necessarily need to be done, but I could have done them in a better way. Looks like the steroid thing that I got into. I think the steroid thing, if we could do things to better our physical ability like they have now, the nutrition now is outrageous. I'm not sure if you're up on vitamin, vitamins now and the nutrition, nutritional supplements now are probably better than any kind of steroid I ever took, but you just got to know how to take them. Yeah. So, so, so you, you got in, you got into steroids, what in, in, in the NFL? Oh, I started probably in Maryland in the NFL. I did it. And then, uh, but the bottom line is you do what you need to do to compete. It wasn't that I needed to do it in the worst way to get better than somebody else. I needed to do it to compete because if I didn't do it, the guy in front of me was, and he kicked my butt and he would. So I kicked his butt. <laughs> yeah, I got some of that uh, Dallas Cowboys uh, scuff marks on. Exactly, got on. some silver on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said you, you you took the steroids. I mean, obviously, it enhanced your performance. And back then, I think in the in the eighties, there they weren't really testing for. No, they weren't. They weren't. They weren't. And uh, like I said, the, the 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 stuff they have coming out now is much better for you and healthier. And uh, so I don't see a necessity to do that anymore. So I think fortunately that that part is out now. I'm not sure how their the NFL right now is keeping up with uh, the head injuries that are going on. We can talk about that for a second. But the head injuries is something that uh, was around. But basically, you strap your helmet on, and get out there and play. There was no no this. You could do this. You can't do this. You go out there and play, or you can. not There was no in between. So yeah, you did it. And speaking of that, you know, you, you you brought you brought a couple helmets with you today and. I gotta say they're pretty, pretty rinky dinky, you know. And, and you know and what? The way they're made, I wish I could get a hold of somebody that made helmets and we could design a, a helmet that pro- provided them as much protection as you could possibly provide without, you know, going overboard as far as weight or size is concerned. Because there's a lot of things that you could do with a helmet that I'm not sure are being done. You talked a little bit about, you know, the the head injuries. I mean, how has it affected you? Let me tell you something. Head injuries are something, if I did not have the people around me that I have now, it's hard to say what I'd be doing. Like I said, the ball that I have signed here by Mike Webster was is a good example. Webby actually died in a car in a junkyard. Do you know that? No. Think about that. What? Here's a guy that was probably the best center ever to play, ever. And he dies in, in, in some park. That's ridiculous. You don't do that. And for the NFL to allow it, I think is bad. What what happened? He died of uh, mostly drugs, but uh, I'm not sure if it was uh, something that was specifically related to the steroids or not. But he wasn't taken care of. Yeah, his head injuries got overboard, and and just like uh, Junior Seau, I'm sure you know a little bit about him. 
he's just a more recent guy. He he played a long time, and his head was so scrambled. He he didn't want his family to put up with uh, anything that was going to happen. So he's figured he's gonna he's gonna kill himself. How sad is that? Think about how bad the situation has to be for you to say I'm better off dead than having me here with my family. Yeah, not good. That's not what uh you know I I know it I I don't think it's totally um, under control you know in the NFL nowadays, but I think it's probably it's it's I think it's came a long way, but there's probably it better still, be. It yeah, better be. You think about it. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, you know we have some kids in this area that are still playing. Remember the kid from uh, GER that's playing at the Colts right now, number sixty-four, I believe. Yeah, he uh, he big kid. He played for GER and he played with us for a year or two up at Lackawanna. Stud, he good kid. So, so what was it really like to play in the NFL? And the bottom line is, you know, it's a job that pays you to do things that most normal people wouldn't do. So, like what? Well, I don't think most people would train like we did. We would train. I could tell you some funny stories when we trained. We used to go and uh, push a car out in the road and uh, as part of our workout. And I tell you, it was hard. I don't know if I could do it anymore, but I, I liked it. I liked doing it. What kind of car did you push? That's a, that's a little little tiny car. Put a neutral and push it. But it's, it's real good for your leg strength, legs and hip. And I tell you what. My weight's been dropping a little bit last couple of days, and I think my, my butt is leaving. My All my power and my butt is leaving. That's where it came from. Yeah. Pushing cars. I don't push any cars anymore. Yeah. You got to start pushing some cars again. I have to. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people would probably want to, like, hear what you have to say, you know, especially, you know, from, from a fan standpoint. You know, you watch these games, and I think a lot of people – a lot of people always like say, I mean, me and my friends talk about it ourselves, but like you always wonder like, what are the guys on the line saying to each other or, you know, in the, in the pile on the grounds? Like yeah. what, what really went yeah. on like on the field, like in those piles and like, you know, cause we can't see that stuff on TV. You can't you hear can't. that stuff, right? You can't. Yeah. I remember a funny story about that. You remember Mark talking about Mark Duda. Mark, he played against me my first year in the league. Of course he was the second year. He had a little bit more experience, so he should have been better. But me and him played each other about the third or fourth game my first year. But that was pretty interesting. Have lined up against a guy that you played against your whole life. But the uh, same stuff went on with more Marky. Yeah. Marky was a stud, though. I liked him. Yes. Yeah, so what was that like playing against your, your friends? You know, the thing about that is you don't want to do bad because he'll make fun of you afterward. So you got to go as hard as you could. But you don't, you're not going to hurt the guy. So I don't want him to get hurt. Like most other guys, I wouldn't care if they got hurt. But Marky, he's a good player. I don't want him to get hurt. I, I read an article. I think it was the Athletic um, online, and I, there was there was a part in that article um, that you talked about like hurting other players, like you just said. Um, was that something that was was told oh, to you to do? Or I'll tell you a funny story. It's coming back to me now. See you at Dallas, Dallas Cowboys, and Buddy Ryan, our coach at Philadelphia, didn't really get along. So Buddy Ryan decides we're going to go down there one year and put a beat on him. He puts a bounty out. Okay, anybody puts this number out, the quarter, whatever the quarterback's number was, they get an extra $500. Well, people went harder for that couple hundred dollars than they did for their game check. Of, I don't know what we made at the time, but it was a lot more than $500. And uh, it was funny. Wow. So yeah. there, was, there was actual bonuses to... But you can't say that anymore. Yeah. But yeah, of course there was. Wow. It's kind of scary, you know? Head hunting at its finest. Yeah. <laughs> the game was totally different, I feel like. You know what? But it was totally different. Is When I played, if I look back 20 years prior to that, it was a lot worse than we played. It was a lot harder. Those, I respected those guys because they did what they had to do to play. They went out there and sold their souls to play. I, I like that. Yeah. Do you kind of feel the same way about yourself? Well, I, I see some of the things I did... I probably wouldn't recommend anybody else doing. So let's leave it there. Okay. Do you have any regrets? Not a lot of regrets because I did whatever I wanted to do at the time. I did as hard as I could and enjoyed myself. It's just like, for instance, uh, when I was playing, I'd be sitting in the off season, and a friend of mine would say, okay, let's go down to Dallas, Texas to go bird hunting. We go out and hunt quail in February. Things like that you can't do anymore. But that's, that's kind of fun things. Doing what you want to do when you want to do them. Yeah. What uh? What what would you say is a favorite memory or two uh, playing in the NFL? 
The NFL, I always had great times playing in the league, and I really don't have any negative stories to tell you. I think that the fun parts were like going down to Texas and bird hunting in February on the drop of a dime. Check this out. I I got to be friends with a guy that owned 89 Hardys. You know what Hardys are? 89 of them. And he would take a private jet to go hunting down to Mexico. So I got to be good friends with him. We had a great time. Wow. That's cool. Things like that. What about what about any any good on the field memories? Uh I said the thing with Mark, me and Mark do that. We had a good time. We played each other. Yeah. And uh, during that game, they played a defensive front that was a seven-man defensive line, and their defensive line was tough. And the one guy, Bubba Baker, I think his name was, grew a real long fingernail. And I thought, you know, I don't know what it was for. I was rookie in the league. And uh, Mark tells me, let's do cocaine. I said, you got to be kidding me. What did I get myself into? This guy's doing cocaine with a three-inch long fingernail. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're, we're playing this game, and he gets in a fight with a guy next to me. He sticks that fingernail in the guy's eye, scratches his retina, and puts the guy out of the game. Right in the middle of the game. Yeah, that's funny things like that happen. Wow. And a lot of people wouldn't think they're funny, but you got to put up with them. they got to be funny or else they turn to be tragic. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you also brought a couple game balls um uh, from from your career and the, uh, the what's the what's the story behind the uh, the Eagles game ball here? It says uh, ah, August. Funny story. Yeah, funny story about the Philly game ball. I got to Philadelphia. So you were and, traded from the Colts to yes. Philly, and you know the the whole reason behind that between me and you, I think in looking back now, I could see why Indianapolis wanted to trade me. My knees were going bad at the time. I needed an operation. They weren't going to get any better. And they, you know what they got for me? They, they got way too much. They got a couple of first round picks and a second round pick, which is our third or something like that. It's, it's way too much for an offensive lineman, in my personal opinion. Yeah. So, so the Colts trade you to the Eagles, and then you, you you played you played the Colts as an Eagle, and you got the game ball, and you guys won by one point. One by one point. I'll tell you what. If you get game film on that, that'd be pretty interesting, huh? Yeah. I think I played decent. I had a good game. By the time my knees were so bad, I needed to get operated on. That whole year was pretty tough because I made the Pro Bowl the year before, I believe. But that year was tough because he couldn't even hardly walk. And when you did practice, you had to wear ice bags on the rest of the night because your knees were shot. You couldn't even walk. So you wear ice bags all night to the next day when I practice, you take them off again. So like you could barely walk, but you could play the game? How? 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 Well, I think a lot of things that I did were good and a lot of things weren't so good. A lot of things that he gave me to take was not good physically. Like pain medicine? Yeah, pain medicines. Just stuff to, you know, to keep you from, to keep you to practice even just to go to the game the next day. Your knees were so shot. So I think a lot of that, I, I was smart. I would do it differently. Yeah. Did you, did you know like at that time like when you were say taking some pain medication, maybe taking a little too much, did you know what you were doing? No, it's a good question, but no, I didn't really. To be honest with you, thinking about it, I really didn't know this. It's just, uh, we used to have these bags of uh, these uh, Vicodins. They were that we even on the plane ride home, they passing them out. All of a sudden, you have three or four guys that didn't take this stuff. You give them to me. All of a sudden, instead of having a dozen of them, I had forty or fifty of them. That's how that stuff kills you. Yeah, it kills you. So did you become addicted to the pain? I medicine? think. Physically, it became an addictive form until I started the CBD. It became a, a something that you could I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk if I didn't have anything. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't so much that I wanted to go out and uh, take uh, heroin to, because I get off on it. I think it was something that if I wanted to go out and play the next day, here's what you take. You had to take it. Take two of these, and all of a sudden it became take four of these, take six of these. And we had some guys that on the team that, that really went overboard with them too. Wow. But it was common. Yeah. And and then at, at one point, at what point in your life did you realize maybe like, hey, like I'm taking too much of this stuff, like I need to make a change? I really never thought of that in those those terms, but it's a good point. It's a good point. I've started thinking about it a little bit more and it'll come to me. When what, when or what was it that made me decide this is not the way I want to go? 
I'm not sure. I'm just thinking about yeah. it now. Was it was it maybe like after your career, you're retired from the NFL, were you still taking the pain medicine then? Oh, yeah. Up until uh, right around the time I met Lisa, that stuff was still killing me. And believe me, if it wasn't for her, I'm sure I'd be dead right now. So, for for Lisa? Yeah, I'm sure I'd be dead. Really? Hmm? Why? Because that stuff really kills you. It, it kills you. It put me in the hospital back in 1993, I believe. And uh, I'm not sure how long I was in a coma, but they almost killed me. From from too much pain medicine? Uh, acetaminophen overdose, I think it was. Acetaminophen. Wow. Which is the product that is made in Tylenol. So what did you do after that? So I realized I couldn't do that. And I started uh, when I hooked up with a friend of mine that started telling me about CBD. I realized that CBD is something that could be used as a painkiller. It doesn't have any kind of side effects that are negative like uh, uh, pills would be. So I started taking that. I felt much better. So Lisa came in your life and uh, and kind of saved you, huh? Pretty much. Pretty much. She threw the life preserver out there for me. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's really great. And we uh, we actually have uh, Lisa with us today. So uh, thanks, uh, Lisa, for, for helping out with uh, with everything today. I really, really appreciate you helping us uh, put this whole thing together. And, and and my aunt Carolyn, by the way, because my my aunt yes. Carolyn, the, the way the way that we all kind of got connected is, is is Lisa is friends with my aunt Carolyn, and uh, uh, Lisa left a comment on Facebook about you know having you come on, and I'm like, well, let's uh, let's make this happen. But I told you we had to get you with two or three other guys that I know for sure would do a good show with you. Yeah. All right. Well, you uh, you put the good word out. Oh, to I'm them. putting the word out there. Yeah. So so what what year did you retire and uh, what you know what did you what did you do uh, in retirement? Let's see, I retired in ninety two or three, and then I went to Lackawanna. I coached up there for a while, and I really enjoyed it. And then when my son became of uh, high school age, I helped Coughlin High School coach, and uh, I found that a lot of rewarding things involved with teaching a kid how to play ball. Because, you know, a kid's learning to play ball, but I'll tell you what, he's learning about life. He's learning how to survive. And I'll tell you what, I appreciated that part of it more so than teaching a guy how to pull on a 47G, let's say. You know, how to teach him how to kick block, kick out a block. All those things are important, but they have other priorities. It's not as important as learning how to do other things. Yeah. What would you say is the most valuable lesson or lessons you learn just from football in general, like, you know, in, in life? Well, that's... I, I think that uh, the way you treat other people is the way that it comes back to you eventually. So it all starts from there. You, the, the camaraderie that you have with teammates is something that you'll never have again, whether it's high school, college, or the NFL. The, that, that teammate camaraderie is something that uh, you don't see anymore. Yeah, what was that like? It was nice because you call, hey, Joe, let's go to, down to hunt down Texas this weekend. All right, let's come on down. I like that. You do what you want to do when you want to do it. But you got to understand there's a time to play and there's a time to play. You, the time to play comes, you got to strap it on and play. Yeah. It's fine. No big deal. So you made a lot of good good friends and friendships during your career. Yes, and I'll tell you what. I wish that I had a connection more with some of the guys that I play with, some organization like the NFL that – I'm sure they have it. They're going to tell me they have it. They have something because the NFL guys let them get together to do some kind of uh, things together in the off season. Yeah, like like kind of get together with some of the players that you played with sure. uh, back in the day. Yeah. You know what? Another thing I'm thinking about now as we're talking about that is uh, the Coughlin High School. Now, the wilkes Bears High School, I would love to get a football field in there and name it after J.P. Mech. Let's put the word out there for that. There you go. It's, it's... Let's get a J.P. Mech field. Over in, over in, for uh, Wilkes Bear, because they use so much of that program. I think just like just like guys uh, they coached at uh, Myers. You remember Mickey Gorham? Mickey Gorham, one of the best coaches ever to come out of this valley. Like JP, those guys need to be. You need to leave their name and put them on the school or put them on the football field or something. You need to know these people. They helped a lot of kids around this area. Was there was there anyone else that you kind of looked up to? Well, I tell you what. When I was growing up, I really didn't have anybody that I really looked up to that I want to be like him. But I know a lot of people guided me over the ways that uh, I was, I'm was. i very appreciative now that I, I'm not even too sure I knew that they were doing. 
But like JP would come over and make, pick me up at the school, take me to practice, make sure I left it, make sure I got home and didn't get in trouble. That kind of deal. Yeah. You don't see that. Yeah. What about uh, maybe some advice for some for some of the younger players, for some of the younger guys playing now? You know what? In all honesty, if I was in high school, I would tell the kid school is a lot more important than you think it is. It is. And as corny as that might sound, I'll tell you right now, you don't go to school, that's going to be something that lasts with you the rest of your life. You know, you're going to be doing that until you're 50, 60, 70 years old. You, know, you, don't, you don't need this. Uh, cut it off. Too many people think it's more important to win on Friday nights. It's not. Learn what you're doing in school. Did you always? Did you know that you were going to go to the NFL? Like, at at what point in your in your life did you say like, hey, like this is going to be a career for me? Good question. I think that I really didn't never even notice that. I never put any emphasis on that. It was just probably good because it made me work harder. I never thought that I arrived. Did you? So you didn't really like have a plan? Like, hey, like my plan is to go to the NFL. No. I had no clue, and I can't imagine a kid in in college doing that nowadays. I'm sure it's done, but I can't imagine somebody going there saying, hey, I'm going to be leaving this place in four years. I'm going to get this. No, you don't see that. You work as hard as you could and get what you can out of it. But that's some funny stories about Maryland. We could, we could talk about I don't know what I could tell and what I can't tell. Let's just say Maryland was a fun time. <laughs> well, we a fun time, time, huh? We had a good time, Maryland. Well, it, we'll leave it at that, and maybe you can tell me one after. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you some of the coaches I had yeah. were funny. Just like JP. We had uh, remember Bobby Ross. Bobby Ross coached Maryland. He coached at uh, the NFL with the Chargers. He coached the Detroit Lions. He coached with the uh, Georgia Tech, something or another. He uh, he coached a long time. But see, those are the people I've been around. Those are the people that make you better. So if I think about now, all the things they're yelling and screaming at me to run harder is for a reason. Yeah, they're not there to just yell at you. Yeah, although it seems to be. It's not. They, they want your best. And and you mentioned the CBD a little bit earlier. How did you how did you get into the CBD, and, and, and what do you think is the benefit to, to a guy like you? You know, a couple years ago... A uh, state representative by the name of Todd Eaches and I met at a football game. He started talking to me about it, and I realized how much better your body reacts to this in it. And CB1, CB2, there's so many different things in the the CBD that uh, that matter that I don't know anything about. But the more I talk to people that do, the more I learn. What else are you up to in retirement? What do you like to do? <sighs> You know what? Right now, I think that I could be a professional bird watcher. And and deer, too, I heard. And deer. Yeah. Deer and bear. And uh, we don't have any bears up the area, but I think I've been harding the birds that come through there are very nice. The other day, I was looking at big flocks of birds flying through, and new new, new, new areas are coming in. All of a sudden, this the spring flock is coming in. And uh, I don't know enough about them, but I heard there's an app you could get and take a picture of them, and it'll tell you what kind of bird it is. Yeah. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. Well, but uh, yeah, I'm going to find out, too. I have a resource for you on the bird watching. Are you ready? Yeah. So a friend of mine, and you might know him, you might recognize him from TV. His name is Chris Bohinski. He is the co-host of PA Live on WBRE. <laughs> so Chris, Chris was on episode 29 of the podcast. I don't think we really talked about bird watching much, because I don't, I, I don't think we, we talked about it. maybe him and I, him and I became friends after that. And I think him and I talked about it then, but Chris is also a bird watcher. And I'll tell you what, man, he's got the resources for you. I didn't realize that I, I watch the show all the time. And I'll tell you what, I really could appreciate it. I'm going to get him over the house this summer. Definitely. He, um, I'm sure he'd be loved. He'd love to help you out. And Chris is a big fan and supporter of the podcast. So I know he's going to be listening to this. So, so That'd shout out to Chris and Chris, guess what? You gotta, you gotta meet Ron. <laughs> I got his picture at home. There you go. Yeah, he'll he'll definitely help you out. He's a great guy. So you also mentioned uh, possibly writing a, a book. You know what? Right now, this part of my life, I think I'm switching over to the author job. Now, I don't know enough about it. I wish I went to school more. Like I said, when I went to Maryland, if I went to school, I'd been better off. But I didn't, so. You just kind of played football, huh? Yeah, I played ball, unfortunately. And now I'm learning a little bit more. I would love to be an author. If I could have somebody that could knew how to write and I could sit down and talk about some of the things that uh, I could about in this book. I think it'd be very interesting if I could just make a, a 
a point and just write maybe the top 20 things that have happened over the, the years that need to be addressed that aren't addressed right now, even. Like some of the some of the difficult things that you dealt with as a as a Correct. player. Correct. Things that I see go on that if they're not changed right now, they better be changed or else the 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 game is going downhill. Yeah. It is not. Have you found anyone to help you out? I really haven't. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at some people that are writing some books now and I'm not sure exactly which direction I want to go. Somebody that's more sports orientated or more knowledgeable as far as the writing is concerned. Somebody like you would know that a lot more than I would. Yeah. Well, hopefully maybe someone that listens to this will uh will maybe want to help and maybe there you maybe, go. maybe maybe somebody will maybe somebody will reach out after this. You never know. Never know. And and by the way, when when that book comes out, we'll have to have you on the podcast again for part 2. Oh, well, you know we're going to do something good with that. Definitely. Yeah. So what what else, what I mean, what else do you think specifically you'd write about? Well, I think that uh some of the things that need to be addressed now, if a kid is starting out, like how the things that they're going to find as they progress and how they should adapt one way or the other and what they should emphasize, like like I was telling you a little bit earlier about the bigger, faster, stronger program that was out of Ohio, they have a program that make you run faster. And some of the things that was done there, I think I trained specifically for it, and that increased my speed down to um, a number that was probably – I will bet you I was probably in the top two or three in the NFL with the offensive line speed. Well, that was your, pretty quick. I ran four six six, which people that know forty numbers, that's four six six is pretty good. And you're, uh, a, bit, you're a big guy. Yeah, I was two hundred eighty some pounds when I ran. So you're like I'm a, motoring a little bit. It's like a missile. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. So hopefully it don't blow up before you get there. Yeah. So is that is that something else you'd kind of want to touch on in the book? Some, yeah, a lot of things like that. A lot of things like uh, the training that I did in uh, to get to what I had to do to be all pro and what it takes and and what is realistic and what is unrealistic. I liked all those things, yeah. even now. And what am I capable of doing? Even right now, what could I do? I would like to go out and set the bench press record for the 50 and over club. There you go. What do you think? You got to do it now. You said it here. It's, uh, uh, it's put it on there. Ev- everyone's going to hear it. <laughs> so no, no going back, Ron. I'll be living with some guys tomorrow that busted me. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what are what are some of those things it takes to become, like, an all-pro guy like you? Do you know, let me tell you something. I think the speed thing that, that I did, I trained specifically to increase my speed because I knew how many steps it would take to run 40 yards. And if I could increase that distance by one inch per step. How many tenths is that? I don't know. A lot. It is a lot. All I know is I increased my time from a five flat down to four six. So we were, we we were with that. You were doing something right. Correct. And did somebody teach you that or did you kind of actually, actually a guy that was a real good track guy at the time I went to school with Ron Savage was a real good track runner at Coughlin. He used to take me out and he used to, he used to believe that if you walk, jog sprint so we go up the dike and walk jog sprint the whole dike and i'm trying to keep up with him i think he did it to just kind of push me a little bit more but he, he was quick so i would try like heck try to keep up with him but he he worked me out yeah those kind of things make a difference yeah just the every every inch correct he's just think about it. if you take your foot and just increase by half inch on each step that's going to increase your speed right but you have to go to a point where you overstride without you can't be too much of an overstride. So think about how could you? I used to do all that kind of stuff. That's why I got to be a four six six. I do weird stuff like that. So you were like one of the fastest guys. How could I put my hands to start to to scale, extend the first step? I got to you know just getting this. Everything was broken down into split seconds. But it makes sense though. It does. It does. It's just it's hard as. Uh, you know, a person like me uh, to understand and to to think about all those things. Like the, I don't think the average person realizes all that goes into, you know, someone like you as a professional athlete playing at such a high level, and all those little tiny details and how much they matter. A lot of it goes into it. A lot of little details. And I'll tell you what. Looking back now, I could. It's. I'm in a fortunate situation where I could look back and say, well, if I had trained 
let's say if I had did more bench press during the week, would I have been a stronger player? All these little things come into play. Well, if I did this, I could have done that. If ands and busts are, or what? How does the thing go? If if ands and busts are candies and nuts, we'd all have a merry Christmas, right? So there's a lot of things I've done differently, but including plan. Is there is there any message or anything else that you'd like to leave with our listeners before we end? Do you know there's there's some thoughts that that uh, that that uh, you know we were we were talking about uh, about how the brain injuries affect a player after he's done playing, and I think that uh, the NFL obviously has got to be a lot smarter now, or else they wouldn't be around. So I'm sure they're doing things that are more progressively geared toward the players, but I think a lot of those things were unaddressed for a lot of years, if you know what I mean. So leave it there. Yeah, and maybe maybe part of this book will also help uh, shed a little bit of light on some of those issues. There you go, exactly. Exactly what we're talking about. There's a lot more to be said, and I'll tell you what. I hope the NFL isn't scared to hear what they're going to hear because a lot of things that they did were wrong, and I'm sure they know it. I just hope it's changed. If it's changed, it's good. Good. But if it hasn't, let's make an issue of it. Yeah. I, I would say some of it probably changed, but I think there's a lot that probably didn't. You know? And especially with the uh, the amount of money that's in the game now. Correct. A billion-dollar business. Billions. Yeah. Much bigger than when you, you know. Not that it wasn't big when you played, because it certainly was. But, uh, you know, it's it's much bigger now. But, you know, just like when I played, we got the game to where it is now. The players that played before me, I think, were more instrumental. The players that played in the 60s and 70s. The picture I showed you before about Bob Pellegrini. Here's a guy that was, he played for Philadelphia, came out of Maryland, one of the best centers. That's back when they went both ways. You you don't know about that. They used to have to play offense and defense the same day. <laughs> that's, a, that's wild. And it's special teams. There's no breaks. No breaks. Think about that. That's when you're tough. That's I'm sure lot. guys will be listening to this be laughing too. But I'll tell you what, you'll be tough to play. Is there is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have asked you? Uh, you know what? I could come back and do 10 more shows and talk about a different thing each time. So whenever you get to be thinking about something else, we're going to do another show. Definitely. And especially after that book, too. And after you set that bench press record. What was the? I, I, over, I said, the over 50. Uh, over 50 record? Yeah. What is that? I don't know. Let's figure out what it is. We'll, we're going to look it up right after this. And hey, um, Who got Google? Yeah. Google it up. <laughs> We're going to look it up. <laughs> and uh, and you're, you're going on a mission. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this was uh, this was really cool. I appreciate you, you, you coming on and being willing to talk about, you know, the, uh, you know, some of the, the injuries, the head injuries and, you know, the opioid, you know, uh, you know, that, that you, you know, you would, you would took Let me on. Tell you something. This is a problem that occurs with so many players. At least it did when I played. I'm not sure how it is now because I'm not around the locker room. But I'll tell you what, the stuff that went on was not right. It, it really is. And if the NFL owners knew about it, they had done something about it at the time, I'm sure, because they couldn't let it go on. But if it's, how long did it go on before it was addressed? And maybe it should have been addressed earlier is what I'm getting at. Like I said, part two, when, when that book comes out, oh yeah, uh, we're going we're gonna to have you back on. Thank you. All right. Ron Solt on the Stacks podcast in the Blue Door studio. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. If you'd like to learn more about the On The Stacks podcast, be sure to search the hashtag On The Stacks on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. We'll catch you next time on The Stacks.